Professor Roos. Professor Roos, you're up. Professor Roos will make an opening statement and then submit to questioning. I've been told I've got a minute and a half to uh, make an opening statement. I'm, I'm a philosopher. I've never said anything in a minute and a half, I'm afraid. <laughs> I can't even get to the verbs in a minute and a half, so let me make my points uh, very quickly. Uh, I, 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 I accept evolution, the, the fact of evolution, so you know where I stand on that. I, I believe in a, a tree life uh, form all the way up to us uh, from some four billion years ago. Uh, I, I am myself a Darwinian. I think that natural selection is the major mechanism. Uh, I recognize that there is significant debate amongst evolutionists as to how far natural selection goes. I think we all accept natural selection probably as the major mechanism. Uh, most don't go as far as I do and Richard Dawkins do, but uh, certainly uh, I accept natural selection. Creation, I quite often use the word creation in my writings, and I don't mean it sarcastically any more than Charles Darwin did. Uh, however, I don't accept creationism with a capital C. I think that this is a form of fundamentalist religion. I don't think it's science. I certainly don't think it's good science, but frankly, folks, I don't think it's very good religion either, whether you're a Protestant, whether you're a Catholic, or whether you're a Jew, or any other of the major religions. So that's where I stand. Thank you, Professor Ruth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Professor Jonathan. Michael, Michael in, in your uh, book, Darwinism Defended, um, you say that uh, many contemporary Darwins show a long, strong liberal commitment in their politics and sexual morality, whereas uh, advocates of creation want to go back to a strict biblical morality. And you conclude the chapter by saying, Darwinism has a great past. Let us work to see that it has an even greater future. Isn't that something very inappropriate to say of a scientific theory? Do you, do you ever hear anyone say gravity has had a great past? Let's work together to see it has a great future. Well, why not, Phil? Why not indeed? I mean, I, I'm, all, I'm all in favor of gravity having a great future. <laughs> you know? In fact, I, you know, I'm taking a plane tomorrow. I'll be very worried if gravity gives up. Um, no, I mean, the point is, uh, it's certainly the case that many Darwinians, many evolutionists have been liberal, but by no means all. You know and I know that there have been many evolutionists who've been, uh, I won't say to the right of uh, Mr. Buckley, uh, but certainly uh, in that corner, if you know what I mean. Certainly there have been Darwinians, uh, Sir Ronald Fisher. I mean, his social views, you know, make one sort of wake up in the middle of the night and sweat. So. Uh, certainly, well, make me anyhow, uh, certainly uh, lots of people have uh, held uh, conservative views. Uh, I suspect you're probably right. I suspect that most scientists today accept uh, more liberal views than conservative views. But I don't see an absolute connection. But I do agree. I, I do hope that Darwinism does have a great future. And I hope that you and I can contribute together to do this. Well, we're going to do our best to see that it doesn't have a great future. <laughs> You've given a very sonorous um, description of change in the universe. I'm wondering whether your, your worldview includes a scientific theory. Now, it would be recognizable by a physicist or a mathematician. Things change, I entirely agree, they do change. Is there something to Darwinism beyond that? I've got a kind of feeling that this is the kind of question, if I say yes, you're going to catch me. Uh, of course. That's why I uh, <laughs> And if I say no, uh, you're going to catch me too. That's uh, right. Um, of course, I, 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 uh, my worldview accepts scientific theories. My worldview <coughs> accepts uh, f theories of physics. But it where is the scientific of theory, theory of biology that you're right. proposing to endorse? Yes, where I, is I, the theory? I think that Darwinism... Darwinism is a scientific theory. Uh, of course, I think and it the has Mississippi been used. is a river. But where is the theory beyond having named it? Where is the theory? Yes, where is it? I've never been able to discern it. Simply well, saying that things change you know, that, is not a theory. You and I are both philosophically trained, and you know that we, we're both into rhetoric at this point because you know perfectly well. That's all there well. is. No, no. Let, let's be serious about this for a moment. Uh, you know perfectly well that if you look at the work, say the writings of somebody like Richard Lewontin, you're certainly and and his mentor. Uh, Dubshansky, you're certainly going to find theories there where people are putting forward Mendelian genetics, they're putting forward the, the Hardy-Weinberg law, uh, where uh, people are showing how selection can work on this, where they the went out, studied fruit flies, both in nature yes, and experimentation. I, I agree entirely. The emphasis of the question can always be displaced by the mechanism of fog dispersion. My question is, with respect to the great 
aching global questions of life, where is the theory that you propose as an explanation? Does it go beyond the mantra, random mutation and natural selection, or is there some solid theory that a physicist would recognize that an engineer could implement? <laughs> Well, I don't accept the word mantra, you see. Once again, you're using a persuasive definition which you're slipping in there. Of course, it's a global theory. If you go, say, to Ireland Biogeography, the work that Darwin did, looking at the finches, looking at the reptiles on the Galapagos, why are they similar but different, similar to South America, not similar to Africa? What because they came uh, there and they evolved. Mr. Ruth. Mr. Michael, Lee, uh, sorry. Michael versus Michael. <laughs> In 1989, the editor of Nature magazine, John Maddox, wrote an editorial with the uh, interesting title, Down with the Big Bang. And in it he wrote, creationists and those of similar persuasion seeking support for their opinions have ample justification in the doctrine of the Big Bang. That, they might say, is when and how the universe was created. And he didn't like that and declared it to be, quote, philosophically unacceptable, the Big Bang theory. So my question is, as a philosopher, do you think scientists use non-scientific criteria sometimes for their evaluation of theories? Oh, I'm, absolutely. No, no question about that. But I'm not doing so at the moment. Yeah. But John Maddox <laughs> may have done so in the past. Well, he's an editor. <laughs> Mr. Berlinski, you want to continue? Or, or Mr. Buckley? Um, to, to what extent uh, do we rely on metaphors and exchanges of this kind the, uh, you, you, you've resisted Mr. Johnson's uh, saying that, uh, <clears throat> that in, in, in such arguments, metaphors have been uh, loaded and are, are tendentious. So you say, well, you're not doing that. Does that mean you disavow those who do as a matter of, uh, as a philosophical matter or simply as a polemical matter? No, Mr. Buckley. I, I, I take metaphor very seriously. I think that uh, one uses metaphors in religious contexts, certainly in political contexts, and there's no question but that one uses them in scientific contexts as well. I mean, natural selection, struggle for existence, uh, arms race today, selfish gene. I mean, these are all metaphors. So I fully accept that science, contemporary science, if you like, is loaded with metaphors. I've never denied that. But the question is, where do you go from there? Does that mean it's purely a human creation? Or does that mean that having devised a theory, whether it's Behe's theory or somebody else's theory, uh, can we then go out and check it against the world? And I think that one can in science. And I think that, despite what uh, Mr. Belinsky says, I think that one can in evolutionary biology, and evolutionary biologists do just that. Thank you, Mr. Roos. Mr. It's your opportunity to make an opening statement. It's your opportunity to make an opening statement. Darwin's theory of, of evolution is the last of the great 19th century mystery religions. And as we speak, it is now following Freudianism and Marxism into the nether regions. And I'm quite sure that Freud, Marx, and Darwin are commiserating one with the other in the dark dungeon where discarded gods gather. <laughs> the problem facing us at the end of the 20th century with a magnificent body of theoretical accomplishment in physics and mathematics and a very rich body of descriptive material in biology is to come to an understanding that when it comes to the large global issues that Darwin's theory is intended to address, we simply do not have a clue. This is a daunting admission to make, but if we're intellectually honest, we should make it. The mechanism that Darwin proposed, that of random search or a stochastic shuffle, is known to be inadequate in every domain in which it's applied. It's known to be inadequate in linguistics, and it's certainly inadequate when it comes to the overwhelming complexity of living forms. There is no reason on earth to believe that this mechanism is adequate to the task that it sets itself. If it should come to pass in the fullness of time that we discover that there is no explanation for life, we will have to accept it. If it should come to pass that we discover in the fullness of time that the only explanation for life is that it is a process designed for transcendental purposes by a transcendental figure, we will have to accept that too. And if that should come to pass,